weeks. My hair cray cray this morning. Okay. First of things, false peoples. Once again, thank you for 800. Actually, over 800 now. <sighs> I still can't believe that number. I look at it um, at least a dozen times a day because I, I can't believe it's still that high. Um, if you comment in this video, please do. But if you do comment in the video, you'll be entered to uh, a giveaway for 800. Hopefully, I'll be able to put something interesting into it. Uh, at least stickers at the very minimum. We're looking for some other flatty things to put into the envelopes. Um, anyway, already. I dilly dallied a little bit, but here we go. Shout out time. Here's a shout out just for you. You support me, so up us. Let's try that again. Ready? Here we go. Shout out time. Here's a shout out just for you. You support me, so I support you. This shout out is for our friend, Fat Ninja DM. And their description says a disabled gamer who talks about mental health, video games, game culture, RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons, which we did once upon a time, uh, Fighter's Path, um, Comics, old school wrestling, and other nerdy stuff. Um, he is not quite at 400 yet, so check him out. Like, share, comment, let him know we said, uh, sent you over to set, stop by, and have a good day. Oh, Tay just a border, tell me something new. Well, we're going to have some fun. Uh -huh. mm. We're going to play with some history, and the, the main snapshot that I was going with is, you know, there was Christopher Columbus in 1492 didn't really discover the America. <laughs> yeah, he kind of ran into it. Um, one of the myths was that he was looking for a shortcut to get to the over to Asia. They pretty much had already figured out that the world was going to be round, so I'm not sure what flat earthers were thinking of. But as things would progress... Uh, you know, there were good things and bad things that uh, came out of Columbus's discovery. Uh, for one, that uh, our germs uh, happened to decimate the indigenous people over here without too much problem. Things like smallpox, yellow fever, malaria, influenza, and the measles um, would cut down on the population as well as how some of the uh, folks from Europe would treat Native Americans. Uh, treating them as uh, lesser beings, sometimes using them for slavery, fun stuff like that. Um, after a while, they were able to break the habit of using indigenous people as slaves, so they brought in black Africans to America to replace the labor source. And of course, uh, besides these happy, fun things, and there were some actually good things that they were able to lead to an exchange uh, when they talk about, you know, the two types of folks, you know, how things benefit on both sides. Uh, from North America, you know, once the market was open, uh, they were able to bring over things like potatoes, corn, uh, pumpkins and squash, cassava, tomatoes, pineapples, avocados, beans, cashews, uh, vanilla, chili peppers, sunflowers, uh, quinine, and turkeys. Meanwhile, stuff that we would wind up, you know, sending to North and South America, uh, a lot of people don't realize things like uh, horses, pigs, sheep, honeybees, uh, bananas, uh, sugarcane, citrus fruits, coffee beans, apples, carrots, lettuce, onions, soybeans, even grapes. You know, uh, these were things that had no. Uh, that because of the Atlantic Ocean, neither side knew about the other's uh, benefits. I mean, can you imagine uh, Ireland without potatoes? Or, you know, uh, the Native Americans without horses? You know, these were exchanges that wound up benefiting both sides that are usually overlooked. 
But after Columbus made his four voyages, and interestingly enough, never actually made it to the um, United States or that area, um, further exploration would come along. Uh, there were a couple different uh, discoverers who would come after Columbus. Uh, a few of them were in the effort of trying to see exactly how big this new land was. Uh, and, of course, they started developing maps, uh, ideas for trade routes. You know, the Europeans are always looking for more people to swap with. But uh, as things would go along, uh, different people would find different ways to go around the continents. Uh, Vasco da Gama, rounded the Cape, was reaching India on the far side hoping that maybe there was a, a second pathway through. And then Columbus, you know, had his uh, reachings with the West Indies, which is irony because they're nowhere near East Indies. But as things went along, uh, you know, from the voyages, there were people that set out and discovered South America, too. You know, of course, we hear a lot about some of their horrible stories that uh, happened both to the Incas and the... Uh, People near Mexico, present day Mexico. I'm just trying to think of the one dude that we hear on uh... Cortez. Yeah, I think yeah. that's it. And what was also kind of crazy was is that you know they had a navigator about 1500. Uh, Pedro Avellas Cabral set sail from Lisbon for India, following the same route that Vasco da Gama did, and he wound up running into uh, the Gulf of Guinea in South America, and wound up discovering the Brazilian coastline. And this is one thing I still find highly funny, is when a guy will find a set of land and then claim it. And you're like, okay, you are one dude, you're going to claim all of Brazil for Portugal. Works for me. See? I'm going to claim Jupiter. Okay, cool. Um, and of course, the Spucci came along later with his expedition in uh, well, 1500 again uh, for Spain as a navigator of a fleet under the command of Alonso de Ojeda. On that mission, he arrived in Guiana and then turned south to Brazil. He believed he'd discovered the mouth of the Amazon River. Uh, they, you know, On his way back, he reached Trinidad, sighted the mouth of the Orinoco River, and then made for Haiti. Uh, Vespucci thought that he had sailed along the coast of the eastern peninsula of Asia. So, yeah, they were missing Asia by about uh, 3,000 miles. Minimum. And details. Minor details. And what was also funny is, is that even, I think, Columbus got close to the Pacific Ocean, but I don't think he ever actually reached it. I know they got to Panama, but, you know, when you sit there and think of the, think of the map and you think of New York to California, that's 3,000 miles, you know. They were lucky that, you know, Panama is only, you know, I think 22 miles widest at its point where they have the uh, canal now. But as things would go along for, you know, history, you had uh, Magellan who would wind up circling the world. Or, you know, he got close but wound up uh, getting bumped off. He fell off the world? Uh, no, he just kind of ran into a problem in uh, the Philippines. I like my version better. Okay. We're going with Angel's version. He <laughs> fell off the world. The world is flat, folks. But as things would happen, you know, sitting here going through my list of the different explorers, you've got Latin America. And the, Spain and Portugal were funny on this because they built what was called the Line of Decoration. Uh, Spain would control so much of this side of the line. Portugal would control this much side of the line. And so Spain would send off their conquerors, conquistadors, uh, to explore and take control of the region, which is now Latin America, like Mexico, Central America, South America, and the islands of the West Indies and the Caribbean. Because the Spaniards colonized most of this region, today most of the people are well, speaking Spanish. Now, we already saw Columbus had made his, uh, his interior you know, position on several of these islands. Um... <laughs> says that the earliest Spanish settlements were in the West Indies with Columbus's arrival there. The Caribbean Sea was essentially transformed into a Spanish lake. Settlement by the Spanish concentrated on the islands of Cuba, 
Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and above all, Española. And the first permanent Spanish settlement in the Americas was established at Santo Domingo on Hispaniola in 1496. Uh, Santo Domingo rapidly became the mother of settlement in Latin America. From this city, major Spanish expeditions of conquest and this settlement set out. The Spaniards found gold, silver, precious stones, and enslaved the indigenous people. Sounds like a recurring theme here. Uh, ambitious men became governors of conquered lands. Missionaries brought a new religion to the indigenous people. Uh, and then, of course, Vasco Nunez de Balboa. Uh, he was one of the first Europeans to look upon the Pacific Ocean from the shores of the New World. Uh, he had uh, sailed for America in 1500, settled in Santo Domingo, and was uh, his unsuccessful attempts to farming led him to debt, and ten years later, Hoping to escape his creditors, Oops. he stowed away on a ship. A uh, ship carried an expedition bound for the new colony of San Sebastian on the mainland of South America, and it was uh, Colombia. When the expedition arrived at San Sebastian, it was discovered that the colony's founder had fled and abandoned the survivors. Oops. Well then. Balboa persu uh, persuaded the superiors to transfer the colony to the region of Darien, in the Isthmus of Panama, there they found in Santa Maria de la Antigua, the first stable European settlement in Central America, and Balboa eventually gained command of the colony. Well, uh, Balboa, uh, meanwhile, had organized a series of expeditions into the indigenous chieftains of the local area to hunt for gold and people to enslave. Sounds like a recurring theme for the Spanish, too. Into um, the recurring theme for everybody. Yeah. The gold is perhaps a reference to the riches of the Inca Empire. Balboa sent word to Spain that he needed reinforcements to explore this area, or steal gold. Uh, in Spain, an expedition was organized, but Balboa was not given command. The king, instead, sent Pedro Arias de Villa as commander and governor of Darien. Balboa, of course, had already set out uh, without waiting for reinforcements on September the 1st, 1513. He sailed to the narrowest part of the Isthmus. It took him 25 days for his party of 190 Spaniards and hundreds of indigenous people to cross 45 miles of dense jungle. And on September 25th, 1513, Balboa climbed to the peak of a mountain from which he sighted the Pacific Ocean. A few days later, the expedition reached the shores of the Pacific, which Balboa called the South Sea. He took position. He took possession of the ocean and all lands washed by it, in the name of the Spanish monarch. Uh, I control the ocean. Yes, I have control of the water. Don't uh, you want to own the ocean? I would love to own the ocean. Very, very wet. Um, the Spain, uh, the Spanish dream of finding great riches in America was realized when Hernan Cortez. Uh, conquered the Aztec Empire around 1521. The Aztec ruled a great civilization of some five to six million people in what is now central and southern Mexico. The capital, Tiahuacan, was one of the largest cities in the world. The Spanish were impressed by the city's grandeur. However, uh, they methodically were destroyed by this uh, wonderful Cortez, and on that ruins they built the Mexico City. Uh, Cortez arrived in the New World when he was about 19, and for several years he worked as a farmer a public official in Hispaniola. In 1511, he sailed under Diego Velazquez to help conquer Cuba. Uh, in 1518, Velazquez sent his nephew Juan de Peralta to explore the Yucatan Peninsula and setting sail from Cuba with four ships and about 200 men, Navarro became the first European to set foot on what is now Mexican soil. Him and his men mapped rivers and discovered Cozumel Island, during their explorations, the men heard tales of a rich civilization in the interior. They eventually met with representatives of the Aztec. Uh, Gibraltar returned to Cuba with the news of the cities and precious metals of the Aztec. But Claus was furious that his nephew had made no attempt at settlement, although Gibraltar's order had been to explore only, so he got in trouble for following orders. How dare he! As a result, Gibraltar was passed over, and the job of colonization was given to Cortes. Velasco soon suspected Cortez of ambitions beyond his orders, however, and canceled his expedition. Cortez, nevertheless, assembled men and equipment and set out without permission. He sailed over the coast of the Yucatan on the, 15th, on the 18th of February, 1519, with 11 ships, 508 soldiers, about 100 sailors, and 16 horses. In March, he landed in what now is the Mexican state of Tabasco. 
Cortez stayed for a time in order to gain intelligence from the local people. Don't you think those would be a little suspicious? You guys don't look Native American. Maybe they just thought they were very pale from illness. Maybe. He won them over and received presents from them, including 20 women. Among them was Madeline, uh, to whom he gave the Spanish name Marina. She became his lover, interpreter, and advisor, and the success of his ventures was often directly due to her guidance. Cortez sailed to another spot in south, on the southeastern Mexican coast and founded Veracruz there. To prevent all thought of retreat, he burned his ships. I mean, that's one way to make sure that they can't leave. You will be loyal, because otherwise we're all dead. Uh, leaving a small force on the coast, Cortez led the remainder of his men into the interior. In his dealings with the local indigenous people, he relied sometimes on force, sometimes on establishing friendly relations. The key to his subsequent contest lay with the political crisis within the Aztec Empire. If they're fighting among themselves, they can't focus on the bad guys. Very sort of true. Many of the people who had been subjugated by the Aztec bitterly resented them, and taking advantage of the situation, Cortes began making allies with the indigenous groups that he wanted the Aztec to fall. He ultimately made more than 200,000 indigenous allies. Well, that definitely changes the color of the pony. On November the 8th, 1519, Cortes reached Tunacan with a Spanish force of about 1,000 indigenous allies in accordance with the diplomatic customs of the region, the Aztec ruler, Montezuma II, received him graciously. However, Spaniards soon seized Montezuma. Meanwhile, Velazquez had sent soldiers to arrest Cortes and bring him back to Cuba. Cortes defeated this army at Veracruz and enlisted most of the survivors under his banner. He returned to the Aztec capital in December of 1520, and after subduing the neighboring countries, uh, he laid siege to the city itself conquering it street by street. Its capture was completed on August 13, 1521. This victory marked the fall of the Aztec Empire. Cortes had become the absolute ru ruler of a huge territory extending from the Caribbean Sea to the Pacific Ocean. Now, further south, uh, a fun fellow by the name of Francisco P uh, Pizarro uh, would have his own little way through the area now known as Peru. Um, they were going through the Inca Empire. They ruled a vast area extended from the Pacific coast and Indian highlands from what is now uh, Ecuador through Peru and Bolivia to central Chile. Uh, their capital was at Cusco. Uh, the conquest uh, is one of the most dramatic episodes in the history of the New World. Pizarro was one of the first Spanish captains of the American mainland. And travel, after traveling to Hispaniola in 1502, he took part in an expedition in what is now Colombia in 1510. Three years later, he accompanied Balboa on the journey that ended in the discovery. How many people like to discover? And look, it's water. Um, I want to discover water. Yeah, discovered the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Azaro accumulated a small fortune as mayor and magistrate of a town in Panama. Hearing that the large and wealthy indigenous people in the south... Azaro enlisted the help of two friends to form an expedition to explore and conquer the land. Hey, you guys, we're going to go conquer some land. You want to come with? Look, I found land. I conquer it. Cool. I'm going to start conquering, conquering cemeteries. I'm going to walk into places and get... This is mine now? <laughs> Bye. Go on. Shoot. I don't think it We should conquer well. cemeteries, exactly. babe. Exactly. No one will fight us. Who's going to stop us? The dead? Well, maybe. But... <laughs> they like us. They won't yes. stop us. No, no. In fact, we'll, we'll, we'll unite under... Well, they're already underground. Um, <laughs> well, hearing about this uh, this thing, the soldier named Diego de Alamargo provided the equipment and helped land the expedition. Hernando de Liquia, a priest, furnished the funds. The first expedition resulted in disaster after about two years of suffering and hardship. Only about a third of the men survived. Oops. Uh, second expedition in 1526 fared a little better. Uh, Pizarro sent Almagro back to Panama with reinforcements instead of sending help, however. The governor of Panta sent vessels to bring back the explorers. Guys, get back on the boat. Uh, Pizarro Didn't... refused to return. He is said to have drawn a line on the ground, inviting all who wanted wealth and glory to step under the line and join him. Thirteen men crossed the line. I want to the see this, the gold first. Yes. Pizarro and the famous Thirteen continued to explore the coast on a land they named Peru. Pizarro then sailed to Spain to ask the king directly for authority to conquer Peru. This was granted. Go ahead, dude. Knock yourself out. Uh, Pizarro, I give you permission to conquer the land yeah, that you already conquered. On, go, and have some fun. Uh, Pizarro then sailed to Spain 
and this was granted Pizarro left Spain with four of his half brothers. I got a great family tree going there too. In 1530, they sailed from Panama the following year. He had three vessels, fewer than 200 men, and about 40 horses. Don't forget the horses. The Spains, uh, Spaniards took advantage of a civil war between two factions of the Inca well, that was just ending. Pizarro spent a year conquering the coastal settlements, then he marched inland to the city of Cacamara. There he met with emissaries of Altacarupa, the Inca emperor. Uh, he accepted an invitation to visit the Spanish commander, partly because the Spanish force was so small. Here, his arrival uh, was attended by a few thousand Inca. Pizarro's followers armed with muskets and cannons, were waiting. They seized the emperor and slaughtered his assistants. Of course. They, 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 these guys just don't seem to understand. These guys are trying to take over your land. Think about it. As a ransom to f obtain his freedom, Alcula was offered to fill a, uh, with gold a room 17 by 22 feet to a point as high as he could reach. Pizarro accepted this immense fortune. He soon had Altapala executed anyway. Well, of course. Yeah. And after the news of his death, the Inca's army surrounded Capamara, retreated, and Pizarro progressed towards Cusco, the royal capital. The Spaniards took possession of Cusco without a struggle in November 1533. Uh, Spanish conquering expeditions soon set forth from Peru in all directions to what is now Chile and Argentina to the south, Ecuador and Colombia to the north, and even the Amazon region to the east. Well, these searches went on. Uh, you know, everybody was looking for El Dorado, a either fantastically wealthy indigenous ruler or a land filled with gold. In the 1530s, uh, three expeditions were searching for the legendary source of riches arrived in New Granada, now Colombia, from different directions. Uh, leaders of these expeditions were Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesadilla. Taco Bell, anyone? Taco Bell. And Sebastian de Belenacazar of Spain and Nicholas Fetterman of Germany. Germany Woo! Uh, Jimenez de was trained as a lawyer and had no military experience, but he going to do Suya. Apparently. Uh, nevertheless, he set off from the ca uh, Caribbean coast of Colombia to look for El Dorado and try to find a land route, land route to Peru. He led an expedition of 900 men up the Magdalena River into the interior of the Colombia, and after eight months of struggling and marching through tropical forests and struggling with hostile indigenous people, the, Columbus, the expedition reached the great central plain of Colombia. This is the land of the Chichaba, a group of tribes that had attained a relatively high state of culture. Although it was not the fabled land of El Dorado, the Chichaba did possess numerous ornaments of gold and jewels. The rule of the Chippewa fled as Jimenez de Conte's army approached, and the conquest of the air appeared, appeared accomplished. Uh, Jimenez founded the city of Bogota in 1538. The two of the rival conquerors soon arrived in the area, however, and challenged uh, Jimenez. This is my land. Claim to Columbia. Yes. Fetterman and his party had set off from the coast in what is now Valenzuela and had, had explored to the south. Uh, Belzenacar, who had already conquered Nicaragua and Ecuador, arrived in Colombia from Peru. The three explorers agreed to submit their rival claims to the Spanish king. They sailed to Spain to plead their cases, but the governorship of Columbia was eventually awarded to another man. <laughs> Who wasn't even there? No, Yay! Yeah. Jimenez de Quesadilla led another expulsion. Quesadilla! I'd like a quesadilla, please. Yes. Uh, for El Dorado in 1569, when he was probably in his 70s, and with a party of 500 men, he crossed the Andes and explored eastern Columbia. He returned after two years of wandering with only 25 of his original company. Wow, Whoops. He wiped them out. He lost a lot of people. Yes. Oh. Meanwhile, another Spanish expedition had set out in 1541. Everybody's always looking for gold. What a concept. This time, one of the half-brothers of Pizarro, Gonzalo Pizarro, uh, with 200 Spaniards, some 4,000 indigenous people, and numerous horses and other animals, he set out to find the unexplored region east of Quito. Food became scarce, however, and Pizarro's lieutenant, Francisco de Orellana, was sent off in search of provisions. He took a homemade ship, 50 men, Pizarro and his men waited in vain for Orinola's return. Forced to eat their dogs and horses, they finally Yay. staggered back to Quito in uh, August of 1542. Only about 80 of his men survived the disastrous expedition. Explorers sometimes are really stupid. Sometimes. 
Arnell, however, made valuable explorations to the east. He marched up the junction of the Napo and Maranon rivers there, according to some accounts. His men persuaded him to the possibility of sailing upstream to return to Pizarro. Instead, Oriana became the first European to explore the course of the Amazon River. Drifting with the current, he reached the mouth of the Amazon in 1542. His party continued to the West Indies and then to Spain. Oriana reported that the Amazon area had hordes of cinnamon and gold. He also told of encounters with tribes led by women warriors who resembled the Amazons of ancient Greek mythology. For this Woo! reason, he named the river the Amazon. Now, here is where we start to get into some of the more familiar American names. The English adventurer, Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, saw the fabled El Dorado in Valenzuela. He, in 1595, he sailed up the Orinoco River in the heart of Spain's colonial empire. He did, loc he did locate some gold deposits, but the English did not support his project for colonizing the area. Back in England, he was accused of plotting to dethrone the king and imprisoned for 13 years. Well, upon his release, Raleigh still hoped to exploit the wealth of Venezuela, arguing that the country had uh, been ceded to England by its indigenous rulers in 1595. With the king's permission, financed a second expedition there in 1617 he promised to open a gold mine without offending Spain however a severe fever prevented him from leading his men upriver his lieutenant burned a Spanish settlement but found no gold and Raleigh's son died in the action the expedition had not only failed but it attacked the Spanish the king of England had Raleigh executed in 1618 well wow. oops but going forward now you know, when we, when we look at uh, the different groups that went up to America to settle, one of the first ones that always seems to come to mind uh, was established in 1607. This was Jamestown. Uh, Jamestown! Down present-day Virginia. Uh, originally, it was uh, settled by the British. And uh, looking at the, the timeline that they have here, uh, it was located along the, of all names, James River. Uh, about two and a half uh, miles southwest of the center of modern Williamsburg. It was established by the Virginia Company of London as James Fort on May 4th, 1607, and was considered permanent after a brief ab abandonment in 1610. It had followed several failed attempts, like uh, the Lost Colony of Roanoke, established in 1585 on Roanoke Island, later part of North Carolina, and Jamestown served as the colonial capital from 1616 until 1699. Uh, despite a dispatch from more settlers, supplies, including the 1608 arrival of eight Polish and German colonists and the first two English European women, more than 80% of the colonists died from 1609 to 1610, uh, mostly from starvation and disease. Uh, they weren't the only people that suffered from disease, apparently. Uh, now, in mid-1610, they did abandon Jamestown for a short time after uh, receiving a resupply colony on the James River. Now, it was also noted in 1619 that the first recorded slaves from Africa to British North America arrived when it's now Old Point Comfort near the Jamestown colony on a private privateer ship flying a Dutch flag. The approximately 20 Africans from present-day Angola had been removed from a British ship from the Portuguese slave ship Salvao Batista. They were, likely were uh, worked in the tobacco fields as slaves under a system of race-based race -based indentured servitude. Uh, one of these numbers included Angela, who was purchased by William Pierce. The modern conception of slavery in the colonial United States was formalized in 1640. But the only problem I have with that is that, uh, while well, the United States didn't technically become a United States for, oh, over a hundred years later. We're slow. We're slow. You know, you like to speculate on ages and numbers. We can always have some fun with that, too. But, you know, besides these folks here, who were, for the lack of a better term, down the coast, you know, there was a group out of England who were basically trying to reach America. And they would make a, uh, an effort to settle a colony to the north. These were the Puritans. They, they, they uh, were originally looking at having two ships, but only one was able to make the voyage when they did in November of 1620. This was the Mayflower. 
They set out in a rather unique time frame because they had to endure 10 weeks at sea in November. I mean, you're talking cold weather, you're talking, you know, rain, driving winds. Uh, just the idea makes you a little nauseous. But they were determined uh, with a crew. Uh, they had 102 passengers, a crew of about 30, reached America. A dropping anchor near the tip of Cape Cod on November 21st, 1620, or old calendar November 11th. Now, uh, the first voyage that the Mayflower actually took uh, took place in 1609, and <laughs> it suffered a wonderful fate. Uh, it was actually taken apart uh, by a shipbreaker in 1624. The ship had a tonnage of about 180 tons. The uh, length was about 80 to 90 feet long, and on deck you had uh, about 100 to 110 feet. Uh, four decks capacity uh, states about 135 people were able to make the trip to Plymouth Colony. Um, the big thing is that they were trying to do was obviously reform and purify the Church of England. The pilgrims chose to separate themselves from the Church of England because they believed they it was beyond redemption due to its Roman Catholic past and so the church's resistance to reform. How dare you? Uh, which forced them to pray in private. Starting in 1608, a group of English families left England for the Netherlands, where they could worship freely. But by 1620, the community had determined that to cross the Atlantic for America would be considered a new promised land where they would establish a Plymouth colony. Now, the Pilgrims originally hoped to reach America by early October using the two ships, but delays and complications, uh, again, reduced them down to one, the Mayflower. And arriving in November, they had to survive unprepared through a harsh winter. As a result, only about half of the original Pilgrims survived that first winter in Plymouth, if not help for, from the local indigenous peoples to teach them food gathering and other survival skills. All these colonists may have perished. The following year, those 53 who survived celebrated in the colony's first fall harvest along with 90 Wampanoag Native American people, an occasion declared centuries later as the first American Thanksgiving. Before dis uh, disembarking from the Mayflower, the Pilgrims wrote and signed the Mayflower Compact, an agreement that established a rudimentary government where each member would contribute to the safety and welfare of the planned settlement. As one of the earliest colonial vessels, uh, the ship has become kind of a cultural icon in the history of the United States. Now, a congregation of approximately 400 English Protestants uh, living in exile in Holland were dissatisfied with the failure of the Church of England to reform for what they felt were excesses and abuses. But rather than work for change in England, as other Puritans did, they chose to live as separatists in religiously tol tolerant Holland in 1608. The separa separatists were considered illegal radicals in their home country of England. How dare they? Ooh, so oh, radical. Oh, yeah. The government of Leyden uh, was recognized for offering financial aid to the foreign churches, whether English, French, or German, which was made as a sought-after destination for Protestant intellectuals. Many of the separatists were illegal members of the church in Nottinghamshire, England, secretly practicing a Puritan form of Protestantism. When they learned that the uh, authorities were aware of their congregation, church members fled in the night with little more than clothes that they were wearing, and class finally made it back to Holland. Now, life in Holland was becoming increasingly difficult for the congregation. They were forced into menial and backbreaking jobs, such as cleaning wool, which had a variety of health afflictions. In addition, a number of these countries' leading theologians began engaging in open debates, which led to civil unrest, instilling a fear that Spain might again place Holland's population under siege, which it had done earlier. England's James I subsequently formed an alliance with Holland against Spain with the condition outlawing independent English congregations in Holland. In aggregate, this became the separatist motivating factor to sail for the New World, which would have had added benefit in helping beyond, be beyond the reach of King James and his bishops. Now, their desire to sail to America was considered audacious and risky, and previous attempts to settle in North America had failed. Jamestown, founded in 1607, saw most of its settlers die within the first year. 
440 of the 500 new arrivals died of starvation the first six months of winter. You think these guys would study how to survive in uh, ad adverse conditions? But anyway, I think they'd look up, you know, living in a new land, yeah, you know, settling, farming, uh, building a new house. Yeah. The Puritan separatists also learned the constant threat of attacks by indigenous peoples, but despite all these arguments and wanting to uh, against traveling to this new land, their conviction was that God wanted them to go hell's way. We verily believe and trust that the Lord is with us, they wrote, and that he will graciously prosper our endeavors according to the simplicity of our hearts therein. So after deciding to leave Holland, they planned to cross the Atlantic with two purchased ships, a small ship, with the name Speedwell would carry them from Lynn to England, and then the larger Mayflower would then be used to transport the passengers and supplies the rest of the way. Now, not all the sufferers were able to depart, as there, many did not have enough time to settle their affairs, and their budgets were too meager to buy the necessary travel supplies. The congregation, therefore, decided that the younger and stronger members go first, and possibly following in the futures with others. Although the congregation had been led by John Robinson, who first proposed the idea of immigrating to America, he chose to remain laden to care for those who could not make the voyage. I mean, that's kind of nice. Yeah. And in explaining to the congregation why they should immigrate, uh, Robinson used the analogy of the ancient Israelites leaving Babylon to escape bondage by returning to Jerusalem, where they would build their temple. The pilgrims and Puritans actually referred to themselves as God's new Israel, writes Peter Marshall, it was therefore considered the destiny of the pilgrims and Puritans to similarly build a spiritual Jerusalem in America. Now, when it was time to leave, the ship's senior leader, Edward Winslow, described the scene of families being separated at their departure. A flood of tears were poured out. Those not sailing accompanied us to the ship, but were not able to speak to one another for the abundance of sorrow before parting. William Bradford, another leader who had similarly been second governor of the Plymouth Colony, similarly described the dis departure. Truly doleful was the sight of the sad, mournful parting, to see what sighs and sobs and prayers did sound among them, what tears did gush from every eye, and pithy speeches pierced each heart, their reverend pastor falling down on his knees, they all with him. The trip to the south coast of England took three days, where the ship took anchor at Southampton on August 5th. From there, the pilgrims first laid eyes on their larger ship, the Mayflower, as it was being loaded with provisions. Now, carrying about 65 passengers, Mayflower left London in mid-July 1620. The ship then proceeded down the Thames to the uh, south coast of England, where it anchored at Southampton, Hampshire. There she waited for the planned rendezvous on July 22nd with the Speedwell, coming from Holland with the members of the congregation. Although both ships planned to depart from America at the end of July, a leak was discovered on the Speedwell, Oops. which had to be repaired. Now, the ships both set sail for America around August 5th, but the Speedwell sprang another leak shortly after. Whoops! Which necessitated them to come back to Dartmouth. Whoever put together the Speedwell didn't plan well. Uh, so I'm not they, hiring whoever put it together, because yeah, apparently no they're not very good with boats. They're doing, yeah. um, they made a new start after the repairs, uh, but after about 200 miles uh, beyond land in the south ocean tip of England, Spreadwell sprang a third leak. <laughs> you know, Somebody is telling them, guys, you don't want the second boat. Uh, either that or go sell the second boat and bring more people. One or the other. I'm thinking you might want to find a new boat builder because apparently this one doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. Now, they had no choice, uh, you know, early September, but to abandon the Speedwell and make a determination on her passengers. This was a dire event as vital funds had been wasted on the ship, very wasted. Uh, which was considered to their uh, success in uh, future for the settlement of America. Both ships returned to Plymouth, England, where 20 Speedwell passengers joined the now overcrowded Mayflower, while others returned to Holland. They waited seven more days until the wind picked up. William Bradford was especially worried. If we lie here waiting for a fair wind as can blow, our virtuals will be half eaten up. I think before we go from the coast of England and if our voyage lasts long, we shall not have a month's uh, vitals where we come to the new country. Okay, I'm a stupid question, but why are we eating the supplies off the ship if we're not on 
You think ship. if they came back to England, they would get more supplies, wouldn't you? I think I would add eat the supplies that are on land and save what is it on the ship. Up. Yeah. Uh, according to Bradford, Speedwell is refitted and seaworthy, having making many voyages as great profit to her owners. They suggest that the Speedwell's master may have used cutting and deceit to abort the voyage by causing the leaks during starvation and death in America. Thank well, you. um, no comment. <laughs> Now, in early September, western gales turned the North Atlantic into a dangerous place to sail. Mayflower's provisions were already quite low. When departing Southampton, they became lower still by the delays of more than a month. The passengers had been on board the ship the entire time, feeling worn out and in no conditions for the very taxing, lengthy Atlantic journey, cooped up in the cramped spaces of a small ship. Duh. When the Mayflower finally settled, uh, sailed alone from Plymouth, on September the 16th, with what Bradford called a prosperous wind, she carried 102 passengers, plus a crew of 20 to 20, 25 to 30 officers and men, bringing the crew to about 130. At about 180, she was considered a smaller cargo ship, having traveled mainly between England and Bordeaux with clothing and wine, not an ocean ship. Nor was she in good shape, as she was sold for scrap four years after her American voyage. She oh, was a high that's after the band. Okay. forward and aft, measuring 100 feet in length and 25 feet at the widest point. The uh, living quarters were cramped with a living area of about 80 feet by 20 feet with a ceiling about 5 feet high. I would be conking my head every time I turned around. <laughs> Shoot, um, the only one who might not be would be Angel. Pretty much. With couples and children packed closely together for a trip lasting two months, a great deal of trust and confidence was required among everybody aboard. John Carver, one of the leaders on the ship, often inspired pilgrims with a sense of earthly grandeur and divine purpose. He was later called the Moses of the Pilgrims, noted John, uh, historian John Meacham. The pilgrims believed that they had a covenant with the Jew Jewish people of old, writes author Rebecca Fraser. America was the new promised land, and in similar vein, early American writer James Russell Lowell states, Next to the fugitive, fugitives, when Moses uh, uh, led them out of Egypt, the little shipload of outcasts who landed at Plymouth are destined to influence the future of the world. The first half of the voyage proceeded over calm seas under pleasant skies, then the weather changed. Uh, continuous northeasterly storms hurled themselves against the ship, uh, huge waves constantly crashing against the topside deck, and one storm, the servant of the physician, uh, Samuel Fuller died and was buried at sea. A baby also was born, Christian Oceanus Hopkins. During another storm, so fierce that the sails could not be used, the ship was forced to drift without hoisting its sails for days or else losing her masts. A uh, storm washed one passenger overboard, John Howland. He had sunk about 12 feet until a crew member threw out a rope, which he managed to grab and was safely pulled back on board. Uh, passengers were forced to crouch in semi-darkness below deck with waves crashed tossing the boat in different directions. Men held onto their wives, who themselves had held onto their children. Water was soaking everyone and everything above and below the deck. In mid-ocean, the ship came close to being totally disabled, or may have had to return to England or risk sinking. The storm so badly damaged its main beam that even the soldiers despaired. By a stroke of luck, one of the colonists had a metal jack screw he had purchased in Holland to help the construction of a new settler home. They used it to secure the beam, which kept it from cracking further, thus maintaining the seaworthiness of the vessel. All told, despite the crowding, the unsanitary conditions, and the seasickness, there was only one fatality during the voyage. Now, the ship's cargo included many stores that supplied the pilgrims with essentials needed, for their journey to future lives, it was assumed that they carried tools, food, weapons, and some live animals like dogs, sheep, goats, poultry. The ship also held two small 21 foot powered by oars or sails. There were also artillery pieces aboard, which they might need to defend themselves against European forces or indigenous tribes. Now, on November 19th, or November 9th, depending on which calendar you look at, they sighted the present day Cape Cod. They spent several days trying to sail south to their planned destination in the colony of Virginia, where they had obtained permission to settle from the company of the Merchant Adventures. But strong splinter winds 
forced them to return to the harbor at Cape Cod Hook, today known as Province Sound Harbor, <coughs> and they set anchor on November the 21st. It was uh, before, before setting anchor that the male pilgrims and non-pilgrim passengers, some members of the congregation referred to as strangers, drew up the signed Mayflower Compact. Among the resolutions, the compact was those establishing legal order and meant to quell increasing strife within the ranks. Miles Standish was selected to make sure the rules were obeyed, and there was a consensus that discipline would be needed to enforce to ensure the survival of the planned colony. Once they came to settle and build a self-governing community, they came ashore. Uh, the moment the pilgrims set forward onto the land, uh, described by William Bradford, the second governor, leading us arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land. They fell on their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and serious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again, to set their feet on firm and stable earth, their proper element. And then they had to deal with their first winter. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, everybody, uh, you don't have to go too far to figure out exactly what sort of winters they have in the, the New England states. You, you know, we talk about uh, stuff that blows off the Great Lakes. You got the whole coastline there bringing in uh, all sorts of fun weather. Uh, on Monday, December the 7th, an exploration uh was launched in the direction of Captain Christopher Jones to search for a suitable settlement site. Now, there were 34 people in an open small boat, 24 passengers and 10 sailors. They were ill-equipped for this bitter winter weather, which uh, they had encountered on the reconnoiter, and the pilgrims were not much accustomed to winter weather, which was much colder than back home. They were forced to spend the night ashore due to bad weather they encountered, ill-clad below freezing temperatures with wet shoes and stockings that froze overnight. Whoops. Bradford wrote, some of our people that are dead took, o took the original of their death here on the expedition. Plymouth faced many <sighs> difficulties during their first winter, most notably uh, risk of starvation and the lack of suitable shelter. The pilgrims had no way of knowing that the ground would be frozen by the middle of November, making it impossible to do any planting. Or were they prepared for the snowstorms that would make the countryside impassable without snowshoes, and in their haste, they did nothing to bring any fishing rods. Now, from the beginning, the assistance they received from the local Native Americans was vital. The colonists reported we dug and found some more corn, two or three baskets full, and a bag of beans. In all, we had about ten bushels, which would be enough to, uh, for seed. It is God's help that we found this corn, for how else could we have done it without meeting some Indians who might trouble us? You know, uh, Governor Bradford did hold out hope. He says, friends, if we ever make a plantation, God works a miracle, especially considering how scant we are of the vitals and most of all un ununited among ourselves and devoid of good tutors and leaders. Violence will break all. Where is meek and humble the spirit of Moses and Nehemiah who reedified the walls of Jerusalem and the state of Israel? I see not in reason how we shall escape, even the gasping and hunger and starved person, but God could do much, and his will be done. During that winter, the passengers remained on board the Mayflower, suffering outbreak of contagious disease, described as a mixture of charming scurvy, pneumonia, and tuberculosis. Fun! Now, when it was all over, only 53 passengers remained, just over half, half the crew died as well. I'm going to have my wife look up something. There's a graphic for this. Uh-oh. On one side, it shows a silhouette of everybody who took the trip on the Mayflower. Okay. On the right side, the only ones that are left, the ones that died are grayed out. And it'll give you that image that you're like, oh, dang. how these guys survive? Oh, you'll have to tell me how to look it up, but I can certainly yeah, do that. Yeah, uh, they fought a graphic or something. But anyway, um, in the spring, they built huts ashore. The passengers disembarked on March 31st, 1621. And the historian Benson John Lossing described the first settlement. This was after many hardships. The Pilgrim Fathers set foot 
December 1620, on Bear Rock in the bleak coast of Massachusetts Bay, while all around the earth was covered in deep snow, dreary indeed the prospect before them, exposure and privations, it prostrated one half of the men before the first blow of the axe had been struck to build habitation, <coughs> one by one perished. The governor and his wife died on April 1621, and on that first month, 46 of the 100 emigrants were in their graves, 19 of whom were signers of the Mayflower Compact. The Jones had originally planned to return to England as soon as the pilgrims found a settlement site, but his crew members had been ravaged by the same diseases that were felling the pilgrims, and realized that they had to remain in Plymouth Harbor until he could see his men to begin to recover. Uh, Mayflower lay in New Plymouth Harbor over the winter, and then set sail for England on April 15th. As with the pilgrims, where sailors had been decimated by disease, Jones had lost his boatswain, his gunner, three quartermasters, the cook, and more than a dozen sailors. Mayflower made excellent time on a voyage back to England, the westerly winds, that had buffeted her on the original voyage, pushed her along on the return ship home. She arrived in London on May 16th, less than half the time it took to reach America. But for what it all happened, you know, when you think about the people that had set out to explore, they discover, braved their crazy. Yeah, you know they they had to overcome things that were just audacious. You know, and these guys were coming to America not to be conquerors, not to destroy things. They were trying to get free. You know, they were trying to get away from England. They just wanted to. Be religious. Yeah. Or celebrate their religion, I guess I should say. And it's it's kind of wild, you know, after all these years, you know, we nowadays celebrate it as Thanksgiving, which is, you know, a time to give thanks for, you know, what we have, what we've been through. They probably looked at it the same way, you know, thanks that we survived this long. Yeah, you know. <laughs> And, I mean, me and Sue, we've, we've been through some real dire straits there, too. So, you know, it's there's things to be thankful for. There's things to remember. But this is the Bearded Wood for the, for the Mud Files. I hope you folks have enjoyed my little story time. And, uh, Next week will be Thanksgiving. Yay. Have a good one, folks. Bye. Bye.